This conference tonight, will now be recorded. Evening. We're going to continue tonight with our topic. This is part two of the kingdom of God on earth. We looked last week at several passages. We started in the book of Revelations. And we saw in the book of Revelations that there's going to be this war, which I called the greatest war in biblical recorded history of the earth and the universe, where you have Satan and his angels engaged in a war against God's angels in heaven. And so there's this war in heaven in the middle of the tribulation and Satan and his angels are beaten in that war. They're thrown down here to the earth. He's very angry and he decides he's going to take it out on Israel and those that keep the, the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, the seed of Israel. So it's associated with the believers of Israel that he's going to try to take it out on. And it states that he has a war against them. Well, what does this have to do with the kingdom of God that's going to be on this earth? It's very important to understand the timeline because first you have the war in heaven in the middle tribulation and the enemy and his fallen angels and whatever creatures are associated with him lose that war in heaven. And the heavens we read are rejoicing when he is defeated and thrown down to the earth and he has great wrath knowing his time is short. So they're rejoicing up in heaven because the accuser of the brethren that accused them day and night before God has been cast out and his fallen angels, trillions of them apparently, because angels are innumerable. And he seems to take a third of them with him in rebellion against God. They're thrown down here too. And he comes down here, down here to the earth in great wrath and the heavens are rejoicing, but they say woe unto the earth because the devil has come down to the earth and he has great wrath because he knows his time is short. Then he engages in the war here and he is engaging in a war with the remnant of the seed of the woman, which is Israel, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He has a war against them. But then we read about the war, the final war, when the Lord Jesus Christ and his saints and his angels come down. And I want you to remember something about last week. Satan and the Antichrist and their armies and the leaders of this world are warring against the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes down here. They are warring, warring against the forces of God again. They are gathered to war against the Lord and his forces. Those are the types of entities that we're dealing with. And they lose that war. They lose the war when God comes down here and destroys them and binds Satan in hell, destroys these armies that are gathered together to fight against the Lord Jesus Christ. He destroys those armies, cleans up the earth, and then, and only then, does he set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. He sets up the kingdom of God on this earth, and he rules from Israel. So some denominations teach that the church is the one that's going to set up God's kingdom here gradually but surely. The church is the instrument and agent of God to set up God's kingdom on this earth. That is simply not true. That's a fairy tale. It is God Almighty who comes down here. As I mentioned last time, when he came the first time in the form, form of a man, he was a humble Jewish carpenter. There was nothing attractive about him. There was nothing about him that anybody would desire to be associated with him other than the miracles that he did as God in the form of a man and those other things. But he was in a human form. The next time he comes, he's coming as God Almighty. And as the conquering God, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Word of God, and he's going to slay those armies we read in Revelations 
with his word. His word is just going to slay the armies of the wicked. All of that must happen before he sets up his blessed kingdom here on this earth. And that will happen at the end of the tribulation. After the seven years is over, Christ will return here, set up his kingdom on the earth. We're going to look at one, one book of the Bible. There are so many references to this in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. You almost could pick practically any of the prophets in the Old Testament and randomly open a book and start reading a chapter from one of those books and land on these passages that predict this kingdom. So I wanted to give you a taste of that by looking at Isaiah alone. I started it last week, but to refresh your memory, let's just start with the book of Isaiah. See what we find about this kingdom in the book of Isaiah alone. So turn to Isaiah chapter 2 and start in verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. Now, when you look at mountains in scripture in relation to the the Lord, it's often is interpreted to mean kingdoms. So the kingdom, the mountain, the kingdom of the Lord's house is established in the top of the mountains. So it's on top of everything on the earth when he returns and sets up his kingdom. And notice that it's exalted above the hills. It's exalted. It's on top of the mountains. And all nations shall flow onto it. So all the nations of the world then are not going to be engaging in war. They're not going to be engaging in these disputes where one nation is armed up to deter another nation. And they have nuclear missiles pointed at each other. No, none of that. The nations are going to flow to God Almighty because he's going to make them flow to him. They're going to flow to God because why? God is going to be the ruler of the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be ruling the earth from Jerusalem, from Zion, the whole world. And his nation, Israel, is going to be the nation of priests and kings that administer his rule to the whole earth. So all the nations flow onto the kingdom of God. And many people shall go and say, come ye. And let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. It's a specific geographic location. Don't get this idea that it's some ambiguous, nebulous kingdom where they're not sure, you know, where it is or what it is. And like uh, there are denominations that teach the kingdom of heaven is on earth right now. This is it. You're enjoying it, people. Well, you'll be able to tell by this verse that simply isn't true. You'll be able to tell by verse four that's not true. But there are people that teach that. They say the kingdom of heaven is within us and it's here right now. But many people are going to go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. This is a law that is going to be ruling the entire earth. It goes forth from Jerusalem from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. God's word is going to go out from Jerusalem to the whole world and all the nations shall flow onto it. How do we know we're not in that time now? Well, of course, God is not sitting there in Jerusalem. He is not sitting there and his word isn't going forth from Jerusalem to the whole world. And by the way, God also hasn't taken out his wrath upon the nations which he will do first to clean out the evil and to bind the evil angels and destroy the evil people. So none of those things have happened yet. But watch this in verse four. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation 
neither shall they learn war anymore. No one is learning war. There is no war in the millennial reign of Christ. There is peace throughout that thousand years. It's only at the end of a thousand years, Satan at the beginning of the millennial reign is bound in hell and he is not deceiving the nations during this time. <clears throat> there is peace upon the whole earth. There is no war. At the end of the thousand years, he is released again. We read about that in the book of Revelations last time. He gathers people around uh, and deceives people again, but that will not be happening in the, in the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. There's peace all over the earth. They're, they're not learning war anymore. And the weapons of war are turned into agricultural machines. So if you have tanks and fighter jets, they're not used, they're, they're destroyed. And instead, they're gonna be turned into agricultural things. So things where you're gonna grow crops and things where you're gonna benefit the people of the earth. And they certainly don't learn war anymore. Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter four. In Isaiah chapter four, verse two. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. That's what the kingdom's gonna be like. Beautiful, glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely, which means it's attractive, it's beautiful. For them that are escaped of Israel. It's not gonna be like today where people are firing rockets and rioting in cities and killing people and murdering and you know it's dangerous to be in a lot of the earth. No, that's gonna be there's gonna be peace all over the earth then. And it's gonna be a beautiful earth, it's gonna be a glorious earth, it's gonna be an excellent earth with the fruit of the earth being excellent. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, why he that is left? Because a lot of them are not going to turn to God. It's the ones that turn to God. It's the Israel of God. Those that turn from ungodliness in Jacob is the way the Bible describes them. God saves the believers of Israel that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not anybody in Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and those that are left at that time are the ones that enter the kingdom. Those that are resurrected to the kingdom will enter the kingdom. Those that are left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. They're all gonna be holy people. God is gonna transform everyone in Judah and Israel that belong to him. And he's gonna take out the stony heart He's gonna have a new covenant with them. So they're all gonna know God from the least to the greatest. And they're going to be a holy people, a kingdom of, of priests and kings. That's what Israel's going to be. Verse four, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof. We know that Peter taught, and we know the Old Testament taught that the the sins of Israel are blotted out at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's when the sins of Israel are blotted out and they're a transformed people. That's what they are. Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter nine. In Isaiah chapter nine, why don't we start in verse six? This is a, an amazing passage, and I love how Handel, Handel's Messiah put this to music. But Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Well, who is this in reference to? Well, you can look at the, the context of it. It has to do with Israel, and it has to do with on the, the throne of David. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So he is a child born, he becomes a human being. 
and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He will be the government, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Always stop at that one and think about that. He's the Mighty God. That's who he is, but yet he's born as a human. Well, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, born as a human, but then later on, he's the government. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. These are not meaningless words. Every one of these words have significant meaning, meaning that he's wonderful. Okay. It's going to be beautiful and it's going to be excellent. And he's going to be a wonderful, perfect leader. He's a counselor. His law and his word is going to go from Jerusalem all over the world when he rules from the kingdom of the kingdom throne in zion in jerusalem he is the mighty god yes he always has existed as a creator came in the form of a man when he walked the earth but he's going to be the mighty god ruling there the everlasting father he's adopted you as children so he has children but he's also the prince of peace how is he the prince of peace because when he rules there's going to be perfect peace forever and ever actually because there's never going to be an end to the peace that he brings and there's never going to be an end to the government that he is in fact his government's going to increase forever and his peace is going to increase forever there's one little time at the end of this thousand years of peace as i mentioned satan will be released just to draw these ignorant people after him again and deceive these ignorant people and they'll be in the kingdom of god and they're still going to be drawn by satan it's amazing to me but that's the way it is but once they are destroyed and satan is thrown in the lake of fire there's going to be peace and there's going to be rulership by the lord jesus christ forever and ever it will never end look at the next verse so he's the prince of peace in verse six he's the mighty god in verse six and verse seven proclaims of the increase of his government and bear in mind this is clearly the lord jesus christ because he was born as a child. He was born as a human, yet he's the mighty God. There's only one person in the history of the world that meets those requirements. No other religious leader ever in the history of the world was God in the form of a man. Who in the world could ever be cl claimed to be God in the form of a man? Whoever did the miracles that the Lord Jesus Christ did? Nobody. Whoever proved that he had power over time space and matter walked on water commanded the oceans and the waves and the weather and raised the dead and healed all people as dallas was saying before the bible study nobody nobody's like that the raised others from the dead was raised from the dead himself to prove who he was the son of god and god the son he also gave other people power to raise the dead and he's the one that promised us resurrection from the dead he proved he had power over death but this same one this same one the mighty god is going to be that ruler of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end and i want to repeat that of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end his government is going to increase forever and ever and peace is going to not end forever and ever he's a prince of peace and he's going to have this perfect kingdom that's going to last forever yes there will be a new heaven and there will be a new earth but what will not change is he's going to rule forever and ever upon the throne of david and that links it with israel oh yes he's going to rule on the throne of david david's going to be resurrected and be a ruler as well the 12 are going to be resurrected and they're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel but he has to come through the upon the throne of david he has to be descended from david and the lord jesus christ was when he was born into this world and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth and that's from the time that he starts to rule even forever so don't lose track that the perfect kingdom of god is going to last forever and people should reconcile 
to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father now, because this is a ruler, the eternal ruler forever and ever is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at the other, another one. This is one of my favorite ones in Isaiah 11. Turn to Isaiah 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Let's start in verse one. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Who might this be? Well, Jesse was the father of David, so it has to be a descendant from David. And it's something that has to be a human. And it has to be, of course, God that we read about in Isaiah 9, but it has to be a human. It has to come forth from the genealogy of David, which Jesus Christ did. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. When you see these verses in the Old Testament that make it clear that God became a man, you should relish them because to understand that he was perfect man, but he was a man. He suffered just like you do. And he was tempted just like you were tempted. He had all the emotions you did. He was sitting there in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was sweating big drops of blood and he was so distressed and stressed out. His heart rate must have been astronomical. He was so sorrowful. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, but he was so stressed in the Garden of Gethsemane. You can't ever say, God, you didn't know what it was like to be a human because he became a human. And he suffered at all points just like you did. But the difference is he never sinned. And he was faithful unto death, the death of the cross for you. He begged the Father, let this cup be taken from me, but not my will, but thine be done. So keep in mind, these passages that show him fully human are there for reason to show you, yes, he was fully human, but he's going to rule forever. Let's take a look at this one. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. He had to learn things as a human. Oh, yes, he did. And shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth. And this is what we just saw when we looked at all those other passages. He shall smite the earth with a rod of his mouth. See, he's going to, with his words, when he returns, destroy those armies we read about in the book of Revelations. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So he is learning things, and he comes from David, yet he is the one coming back as God, slaying the wicked, destroying them with his mouth, with his words. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Now, we're getting into nature. He transforms animals when he returns and sets up his kingdom. And they are like they were in the Garden of Eden before the fall. They're better than they were then. The animals and nature are going to be transformed. What were they created for? To be helpers for us. Were they created for us to kill them? No. And eat them? No. And them to kill us? No. They were made to be our helpers. They communicated with us. We communicated with them. Everything ate plants and herbs and fruits and nuts and things like that. They, did, they weren't eating meat. If you look at the biblical account in the Garden of Eden, nothing ate meat. It ate herbs. Everything ate herbs. Humans did. Animals did. No, the bow and the sword came into nature where they started to eat meat and humans ate meat when the fall occurred, after the fall occurred, actually. But God is going to transform nature in his kingdom so that nature will be different, so that there'll be friends again. Us and the animals will be friends again. Us and these wild animals that today, you can't go out in the wild and try to hug one of these things. You're going to get a bear claw upside your face. You're going to get a lion 
predating you. You're going to get a wolf running away from you and a leopard maybe jumping on your back and killing you or running away from you. But not so in the kingdom of God, not so, because God's going to make it back to the way it was meant to be. And look at verse six. And the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Today you put a, la a, a wild wolf and a lamb together and why don't you see what happens? The wolf's gonna eat the lamb. Today, why don't you put a kid, a baby goat and a leopard together and see what happens? The leopard's gonna eat the kid. Why don't you try putting a little calf in with a young lion and see what happens today in the wild. The lion's gonna eat the calf. But not so then. No, the wolf's gonna lie down in this kingdom of God with the lamb. The peace is gonna cover the earth such that these animals are gonna be transformed and they're gonna have peace. They're not gonna hurt each other. The wolf's gonna lie with the lamb. The leopard's gonna lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, they're lying down together. They're at peace one with another. And a little child shall lead them. So a child can take the wolf and the lamb and the leopard and the kid and the lion and lead them along. Come on, wolf and leopard and lion, follow me along with the calf. And they all just walk peacefully together. This is going to be so beautiful. The whole picture of it is amazing. And these are animals, whether they're resurrected animals or whether they're animals that are just transformed by, by God, I suspect they're animals transformed by God. But the child is leading them. In verse seven, and the cow and the bear shall feed. So they're getting along too. And their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. What a, what a picture that is. You can just hug a bear. You can lie down with a bear. You uh, little children can lie down with a bear and a lion. And the lion is not eating meat anymore because God is transforming it to the way it was meant to be. And you remember as a child, you thought you could play with the animals like Dr. Doolittle. There was some point in your life where you thought, I'm going to go play with the animals. You might have liked that movie at Dr. Doolittle. The old version, I'm not speaking of the new version, I never saw that. I imagine it's vastly inferior. But the old version where you can talk to the animals, you can interact with the animals. Every child, I think, has some desire, you know, to have pet things. And also, it, they think, well, maybe I can have make friends with a bear and a lion. Well, I think God has put that into us because that's the way it was meant to be. And that's the way it's going to be. Because the, the lion will be your friend again. And the lion will not be carnivorous. He will not be eating other creatures. He will eat straw like an ox, just like a cow on, out in the field eating straw. There's a lion. It's enjoying the hay. Oh, I can't wait for that. That's a beautiful thought for me. I just am really excited about that. And the, the sucking child, so this is a child that is still getting its mother's milk, shall play on the hold of, hole of the ass. An asp is a venomous, it's a viper found in the Middle East. You could put your little brand new baby who's getting mommy's milk and you could put him right on the hole of an, a poisonous snake. And it won't hurt him or her. It won't hurt anymore. And you could take a wean child and put him on this venomous snake den. And they're there, but they're changed. They're not poisonous anymore. They're not gonna hurt you because verse nine says, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The earth is gonna be covered with the knowledge of the Lord. They're gonna be godly people because God is gonna kill off the wicked people and these people that stink up the earth with their sin and their wretchedness. He's gonna, he's gonna kill them all. And there's going to be this knowledge of the Lord and it's gonna be beautiful. And verse 10, and in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse. There's the Lord Jesus Christ who rules forever and ever and ever. 
the Prince of Peace, the mighty God of Isaiah chapter 9, he shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it, the root of Jesse, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall the Gentiles seek. And his rest, that's entering into the presence of God, his rest shall be glorious. That's what it's going to be like. It's going to be a glorious place here. Something none of you have experienced or ever imagined how great it's going to be. It's going to be amazing in that day. It really is. It's going to be just glorious, excellent, lovely, beautiful. God actually eliminates a whole language from the face of the earth in verse 15. He eliminates the tongue of the Egyptian sea from the tongues of men. They are not going to be able to speak that language anymore. But let's go to another passage in Isaiah. You could go through Isaiah and get a picture of this kingdom. Just staying in Isaiah. Look at this. The lion and the human child and the poisonous snakes, all friends again. And the bear and the wolf and the leopard. Oh, all of them just lying down together, having a great old time. You have a lion eating straw like an ox. You go up and give him a hug, and he'll probably like a nice scratch, just like a pet dog. This is going to be amazing. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And this one, if you want to get a picture of what it's like in hell, this is a good place to look at it. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14. And to learn about Satan. But I'm not going to go over too many of the verses here. I'm just going to try to summarize some of them. And let's take a look at them. For the Lord, verse 1 of Isaiah 14. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel. See, that's the future kingdom. And set them in their own land. And the stranger shall be joined with them. And they shall cleave to the house of of Jacob. Verse 3, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give them, shall give thee, Israel, rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou was made to serve. And then there's this proverb that is brought against the king of Babylon. You can read who that is. It's Lucifer. He's identified in verse 12. There's no mystery about this. In 12, it's verse 12. It says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Well, that's if you use the King James Bible. They take the name Lucifer out in a lot of the other versions. But let me, let me tell you, show you why I come here. See, it's reference to Satan. And watch this. When Satan is thrown into hell, and you can read the context yourself for the sake of time, take it and study it. But I'm, gonna, I'm going to get right down to the point here. When Satan is thrown into hell, and that's going to occur when God sets up his kingdom at the end of the tribulation, the oppression on the earth, Ceases. Verse 4. How had the oppressor ceased? Verse 5. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. So all the evil rulers of this earth are broken. All the wickedness is destroyed on the earth. Satan is the oppressor. He stops. Why? Because he is chained by an angel and taken down into hell according to the book of Revelations, and here, and thrown down into hell. Well, why don't we, we'll go back up to the verses I was going to show you. Let me just show you what it is. Verse 9, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. So he is taken into hell. He is taken into the bottomless pit. Hell and the bottomless pit are the same thing. Don't let anybody deceive you into believing, oh, Hades, that just means death. No, it doesn't just mean death. It's a place of suffering and wrath. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Even all the chief ones of the earth, it hath raised up from the thrones all the kings of the nations. They have hierarchies in hell. 
There are kings of nations of ungodly leaders down in hell. They have different hierarchies or different levels of hell. All they shall speak and say unto thee, art thou also become weak as we are? See, they're weak down there. That's what they're like in hell. Art thou become like unto us? They're all weak down there. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. So all the majesty of Satan and all the incredible things about his beauty and his wisdom and his music are brought down to hell with him. Verse 11, thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials. He is a musical creature. We've studied that in the past. He was built with music in him and his music projected across heaven. And he controls people with his music, his beauty and his wisdom and his power that he was made the anointed cherub by God. And then he rebelled against God. The noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee and worms cover thee. There are worms in hell that don't die. He's covered with worms underneath him, on top of him, underneath him, spread upon him. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? And then it explains why. He wanted to become like the most high God is what he would wanted to be. I will be like the most high in verse 14. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You see how hell is the pit, the bottomless pit? They that, that, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? He, These people that follow him are prisoners of his. The atheists are prisoners of him. They've been conned not to believe that there's a creator of all these trillions of stars and of this earth that spins on its axis and all the machinery around us of these insects and birds and animals. They don't believe in a creator. They're prisoners of Satan. He doesn't open their house. Well, let's go up to the top and see what happens when he's bound. This is, has to do with the kingdom of heaven uh, that's going to occur on this earth and God's kingdom on this earth, and what happens? Verse eight, he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, that is Satan, and that's what he does to his children and to the righteous at times as well. He smites them with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger, that Satan, is persecuted, and none hindereth. Here's what it's going to be like when he's done away with. It, or when he's bound in hell. When Christ sets up his kingdom here. The whole earth is at rest. The whole earth is going to be at rest. It's all going to be peace. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be excellent. It's going to be glorious. All the things we read about. It's going to be beautiful. The whole earth is at rest. And is quiet. They break forth in singing. They're singing on the earth because it's all lovely and peaceful. The animals are happy. The, the whole creation is waiting for this time, for the manifestation of the sons of God, for the deliverance from this oppressor. And they're gonna get it. They're gonna get the rest. They're gonna get the peace. They're going to get the beauty. They're going to get the excellence. Those that are here and are enjoying that. And the animals and the trees and the humans. And they're going to be singing. The trees of the field and the whole. There's, there are things that explain how it seems like everything. What we consider inanimate objects. Rocks and hills and valleys and trees and all are going to be singing unto God. It's going to be the most beautiful music of all time. Nothing here ever compares to that music that God's going to have in the future and the joy and the peace you're going to have from that. But look at verse 8. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, that means thrown into hell, no feller is come up against us. Do you see the trees rejoicing? Yes, the rejoicing that started in heaven when he was thrown out of there in the middle of the tribulation comes back down to the earth and the whole earth is at rest and singing in joy. And the trees are rejoicing when he is thrown out of here. 
yes, the earth is going to be lovely then, beautiful and excellent. And the trees and the animals are going to be happy. The whole creation's waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, and they're going to enjoy that. And I even even haven't even gotten through much of Isaiah. L allow me, I'm going to do one other uh, section of Isaiah. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40. I didn't want to go on too long tonight, but this topic is just such a beautiful topic. Uh, it's something we should think about because the future of the earth is going to be perfect. It's going to be ruled by a perfect God. All the imperfection is going to be done away. And if you don't understand what God is doing to Israel and through Israel and how Israel, the whole core, the apple of his eye of this new kingdom, then I don't know what, you're, what Bible you're studying. I don't know if you're studying the Bible carefully because there's some people that teach a substitutionary theology. They teach that somehow Israel's done away with, replaced with the church, and there's no more Israel in God's sight. That is absolutely not true. Look at the passages we looked at. Where is he ruling from? Zion, Jerusalem. Who is it referring to? Who is he comforting? His people, Jerusalem and Israel. They are the heart of the kingdom of God. That's going to happen here. And it upsets me. I really get upset when I think about this substitutionary theology, seeing that somehow now it's a church has nothing to do with Israel anymore. Simply is there's no truth whatsoever to that. Sure, now in the church of body of Christ, the only truth I would say to it in the church of body of Christ, the Jew and the Gentile are alike in the body of Christ. But God will yet choose Jacob. We read about that in the previous verses in Isaiah. He's going to choose Israel again. They are the shining kingdom of God on the hill of the future. It's not some earthly Gentile church. Verse 1 of Isaiah 40, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Who are the people that God is comforting in this future kingdom? Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Ah, that's who it is. And cry unto her that her warfare is, gonna, is accomplished. That's what's going to happen in the future kingdom of God. That her inequity is pardoned. That's what's going to happen in the future kingdom of God. As Peter taught in Acts 3.19, their sins are blotted out. As Daniel taught in, in Daniel 9, their iniquity is pardoned. Their sins are blotted out. Their warfare is accomplished. Okay? And that's what is going to happen to them. Now it gets into John the Baptist in verse 3. We know that was fulfilled by John the Baptist when he walked the earth. But let's jump ahead to the kingdom. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. So the valleys, those things that in this earth are not exalted, God Almighty and his future kingdom are not exalted. Then they're going to be exalted. And God's government's going to rule the world, unlike now. It does not. He does have vestiges of his government in a criminal justice system in the world. He also has vestiges of his government because he sets up government to keep evil people in check in the book of Romans. But he is not ruling over this earth as the supreme leader of this earth, the dictator and righteous and holy leader of this earth as he will do when he returns. Every valley is going to be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And all the crooked, nasty places of this world with the corrupt and evil, wicked rulers and wicked people here. Oh, those he's going to straighten out by eliminating those people. The crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together. All flesh is going to see the glory of God together. Even those in the grave are going to see him. God is going to make it so those people in hell and in the grave are going to see him when he returns as the ruler of the world and as the holy, righteous Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is going to be revealed. All flesh is going to see him together, not only in this earth, but those that are in the graves are going to see it. For the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. 
Look at verse five, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord have spoken it. Go down to verse nine. O Zion, that's Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up and be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Yes, he's gonna be there. He's gonna come back. He's gonna come back in verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand. So that's God Almighty, the God of Israel, the God of Zion, the God of Jerusalem is going to return and he's going to rule with a strong hand. You see the same theme over and over and over again that we've been looking at all the way through uh, the book of Isaiah. So I'm going to end it there tonight and we're going to continue again on Thursday with this kingdom of God on this earth and this glorious topic about a glorious world and a perfect world that God is going to rule over from Jerusalem, through Jerusalem, through Israel. And we're going to read some more about it. And there's so much about it. It was hard for me to eliminate certain verses. I wanted to cover so many, but I decided let's just stick with Isaiah for tonight. And then we'll get into other passages on Thursday. So God bless you and we'll see you on Thursday.